Good evening. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Jenna Burke. I'm a premium tutor and executive function coach here at Apple Ruth Education. And I'm so excited to be talking with you tonight about LD ADHD 2E, how to support students who learn differently. I'm going to try to save a lot of time at the end for questions. So if there's anything that you're wondering about, please drop them in the chat in the Q&A and I would love to answer them at the end. But first, a quick introduction, our why. So the reason why Apple Ruth even exists is our core belief that when you change students' self-beliefs, you change their lives, you change what they're capable of accomplishing. And we do that through building skills for school and beyond, um, whether it's academic tutoring, test prep, or executive function coaching. So this evening, what I'm going to be covering is uh, common learning differences that you might have in your own home or for yourself, um, discuss some common accommodations for students with those learning differences, and introduce strategies that you can use in your own home. But first, let's do some definitions because I threw around a lot of acronyms in the title of this talk. So attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorder, also known as ADHD, affects a little under 9% of children. Um, usually what you're seeing here is some differential brain development or delays in brain maturation, um, usually accompanied by challenges with executive functioning, which I will define in just a second, um, as well as regulating attention and inhibition. Uh, but there are some different types of ADD or ADHD. So ADD inattentive is when an individual has difficulty holding their attention on tasks easily, doesn't seem to listen, might have trouble organizing themselves, and generally has to exert a lot more energy to create the inhibition to not you know, stare out the window. Uh, ADHD hyperactive is what I would say is probably what a lot of people think of stereotypically as a someone with ADHD. And that's usually characterized by a lack of physical inhibition. So someone who's on the go or driven by a motor. So a lot of interrupting or physically intruding on others. And then of course there's ADHD combined, which gives you symptoms of both inattention and hyperactivity. So what makes the ADHD brain different? This is not just a, if only this kid could just run around a little bit more, they wouldn't have so much energy. There are actual changes in the brain that cause this kind of dysfunction. So what we're really paying attention to are four different areas. The frontal cortex, which controls your attention, your executive function and organization. The limbic system, which regulates your emotions as well as attention, because emotions are a big part of ADHD. The basal ganglia, which causes interbrain communication. Um, it should be working, but sometimes it'll short circuit, which then presents as inattention when it's actually something that's going on in the brain. And the reticular activating system, which is a major relay system in the brain, and that can also cause inattention, impulsivity, and possibly hyperactivity. So the main culprits for ADHD are norepinephrine and dopamine in general. So norepinephrine is made from dopamine. It's a chemical messenger that transmits nerve signals and it can increase your alertness, your arousal, your attention, and also affects your sleep-wake cycle, your mood, and your memory. So if you've ever um, come into contact with somebody with ADHD and you wonder how they can survive with so little sleep, or it seems like they're always forgetting things, that is part of having ADHD. And in general, dopamine regulates the pleasure center of the brain. So if you don't have a lot of dopamine in your brain, it's really hard to pay attention to something that doesn't naturally interest you if your brain is saying, I don't have enough dopamine, I need to find something that's more interesting, that's more pleasurable. The flip side of this is hyper-focusing. So you're finally getting to pay attention to something that brings you pleasure. And so of course, you're gonna stay up down some Wikipedia rabbit hole reading about um, you know, the German tactical elements of World War I um, until four in the morning because finally you're getting that dopamine hit. 
So that's why I personally like to look at ADHD, not as an attention deficit disorder, but as an attention dysregulation disorder. It's not that people with ADHD don't have attention spans or they don't have attention. It's that their attention is dysregulated, whether they have too little of it or too much of it. And neurodiversity diagnoses frequently co-occur. If you've got ADHD, you may also have a learning disability. There's an overlap of between 31 to 45 percent. Um, if you have dyslexia, you may also have ADHD. If you have ADHD, you may also have dyslexia. Um, there's also a wide uh, overlap with autism spectrum disorder. So a lot of these diagnoses are not just something that is in a silo. They're affected by other, other things going on, which makes sense because, you know, the brain is a very complex area. So if one thing changes, it makes sense that it's going to affect a lot of different areas. So I've been talking a lot about executive functioning skills. So let me actually define what those are. Um, so in general, when I'm talking about executive functioning, I'm talking about the ability to plan. Um, so, you know, saying like, okay, I've got this paper coming up in two weeks. How am I going to get it done? A plan. Prioritization. Okay, I've got that paper in two weeks, but I also have a test that's in three days and homework that's due tomorrow. So which of these is gonna need to take priority? Well, I'm really interested in the paper, so I'm gonna start drafting that now, even though the homework is due tomorrow. Um, organization, the ability, whether that's, oh, I know where my papers are, or, oh, I forgot the homework at home, now I don't have it to turn it in at school. Uh, goal setting and follow through, which can be really hard to do if you're not good at planning, prioritizing, or organizing. And then sometimes if you realize like, oh, I never do what I really want to do, it's harder to set goals for yourself and then follow through because you're waiting for yourself to fail. Time management, big one for people with ADHD, whether that's time blindness, so you don't realize how long something takes you, or just thinking that, you know, why does this homework assignment take me three times as long as my friends? This is so frustrating. Uh, Self-regulation, which sometimes has to do with the more emotional side, whether that's, you know, flying off the handle if you're really upset about something or being really overjoyed and not being able to keep an even keel. Self-monitoring, which is the ability to understand whether things are going well for you, or if you're going to say like, oh yeah, I'm, that class is going really, really well, and then getting surprised that you're getting a D, um, and then realizing, well, yeah, I guess I didn't really turn in the homework or study for the tests, but like I felt like it was going really well. And inhibition, the ability to stop yourself from doing something, whether that's okay, I've been relaxing and watching TV, but now I need to stop and go study. And the ability to stop and do the thing you don't want to do is a really important one and something that can sometimes be lacking. So the three pillars of these executive function skills are your working memory, your cognitive flexibility, and self-control. So you can see a lot of these pillars sort of overlap with many different categories of executive function skills. So working memory, really important when you're figuring out, when you're planning or prioritizing, remembering everything that you need to do. Cognitive flexibility really comes in with inhibition. So being able to transition from one thing to another um, or time management, being able to say like, okay, I wanted this to take 20 minutes, but it's now taken 30, which means I now need to alter how much time I'm going to be spending on other things, having the flexibility to do that. And of course, self-control, whether that's with inhibition. Yes, I would love to watch Gossip Girl for the fifth time, but I actually really need to study for this test tomorrow. Um, you know, sort of being able to have that self-control, which is something that, you know, especially teenagers are still working on anyway. But if you have ADHD or something else that makes self-control even harder, all of this is going to be much more of a challenge. So now moving on to dyslexia. So I... <laughs> I use this example of a font, not because it is literally um, what 
dyslexic see when they're trying to read. Um, this was actually created by an artist who wanted to be able to give neurotypical people a glimpse into what it is like to read as a dyslexic person. So in this case, he wanted to see, you know, how can I make letters technically different, but still really hard to decode. So I, I think it's a fascinating experiment just to sort of build your, your sense of empathy for what's going on. And it's not just somebody being difficult or stupid or, you know, all kinds of negative things that have been said about people with dyslexia unfairly, inaccurately, uh, but it just does sort of give you a little bit of a taste. So what is dyslexia? Um, dyslexia, a, according to the International Dyslexia Association, is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological. So it has to do with the brain and other biological factors uh, within you. So you can see it with uh, difficulty with accurate or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. So encoding is spelling, right? Creating the word. And then decoding is knowing what that word means. So whether that's when you're writing something out, it's very difficult for you to spell it correctly or the letters end up backwards um, or decoding, reading those words later and figuring out what they mean. So this usually results from a deficit in the phonological component of language. And I think this is important. It is unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities. So this doesn't have anything to do with the intelligence of a person, with their academic capabilities. It is something going on in the brain. Um, so this may include issues with reading comprehension, just because it's really hard to read when the letters all look the same, and a reduced reading experience, which then impedes your growth of vocabulary and background knowledge, just because our society is really strongly built around the ability to read. And then 2E, which I referred to in the title of this talk, um, also stands for twice exceptional. So this is something that has, as a term has been around for a while and I think is starting to get a little more ground, but what it means basically is that you've got children who are twice exceptional. They're exceptional because they uh, have the characteristics of being gifted with the potential of high achievement, and they also have one or more disabilities as defined by federal or state criteria. So this could include a specific learning disability, a speech and language disorder, an emotional or behavioral disorder, a physical disability, being on the autism spectrum, ADHD, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and this can get really interesting when you're in the classroom. So what a teacher might see is, oh, look at this student. They have such interest in in this sample student that I have, math and science. Loves math and science. They've got excellent understanding. Their problem solving skills are fantastic. But as soon as I get them to do anything involving reading or writing, it all falls apart. And their homework, note taking, assigned reading, it is so difficult to get them to do it, to turn it in. It's like pulling nails. I don't understand what the matter is. What the parent might see is that the homework is a struggle every single night. Assignments that the, their students' friends complete quickly takes their student hours. The backpack is a mess. My student doesn't know where anything is, but has intense and deep interest in sometimes really complicated subjects outside of school and can engage and be enthusiastic about those topics for hours but still says, I hate school, I don't wanna go. So it's kind of this, this conflict of, you're deeply interested in these subjects that sometimes you know, require a lot of intellectual rigor to understand, but then when it comes down to school, that's when it becomes really difficult. And of course, there are several other learning differences that I haven't even dug into yet. Everything isn't just ADD. Um, your student could have memory or retrieval issues, auditory processing issues, visual processing issues, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia. Um, so for instance, dyscalculia, not just dyslexia for numbers, which a friend of mine was once told that's not quite what it is. Um, yes, it does mean sort of a difficulty processing numbers, but for instance, I have an exercise here on the screen. 
Um, if you look at all of these dots and think about how quickly can I count all of these, you might count them by grouping, right? You might go, okay, I've got like four there and four there, so that's eight. And then there's one all by itself on the top left, so that's nine. But if you have dyscalculia, it takes you longer to count the dot patterns because you're counting one by one instead of being able to recognize a group. I think that's very cool. So accommodations, so important, so, so helpful. Getting the right accommodation in school can solve so many different issues for students with LDs. Um, and the extra time is, is a, a really obvious one. I think a lot of people are familiar with that. And the thing of it is that it is really helpful for some students to be able to show what they know when they have enough time. And I have been tutoring with Apple Ruth for a very long time, easily over a decade at this point. And I know some of my students who are neurotypical might be like, ah, oh, you know, I wish I had extended time. Like, that's all I really need. And the thing is that for students with, say, processing issues or ADHD, getting the extra time just puts them on an even footing with other students. That's all that it is. And this is not just for school. I've definitely had parents push back on getting accommodations for their student because they felt like, well, once they graduate, they're going to be out in the real world and they're not going to get those accommodations anymore. How are they going to survive? Well, I'm delighted to report that the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, includes learning disabilities as conditions where an employer may be entitled to reasonable accommodation or modification in order to ensure their ability to effectively do their job. So getting accommodations in, say, high school will enable you to more easily get those accommodations in college and then feel more confident about advocating for yourself in the workplace. So yes, accommodations are wonderful if you're taking a standardized test like the SAT or ACT or APs, but it's really important to have them documented. Um, just going to put that out there. That's This is my plea. Please, if you think that this is something that might help your student, please at least look into it. Um, but in order to qualify for this formal accommodation plan, you will probably need to be evaluated. And there's a lot of different ones out there. So these are three of the most common. So a psychological evaluation or a psych eval is typically intended to guide diagnosis and treatment from a medical perspective. So if you need to say, um, medication, this might be helpful, but it's not necessarily going to give you um, any idea about what needs to happen from an educational perspective. A psychoeducational evaluation or a psych ed eval identifies the student's difficulties in the classroom and their learning style generally and what is happening. So this might not give you enough data to diagnose and recommend treatment for a disability, but it'll let you know this is what's going on in the classroom. A neuropsychological evaluation or a neuropsych eval is sort of, it, it brings in everything. So you've got your formal assessment of cognitive functioning that's controlled by different regions of the brain. It's really focused on why the difficulties are happening, what neurologically is going on to create these issues. And this can be used to diagnose a disability. And then you get to the formal plan. So you've got your diagnosis, you know what's going on, uh, and then there's all of these acronyms and numbers to figure out. Um, so a 504 plan is developed for students who have a disability that do not require special education services. So this could be for a student who is mainstreamed into school, they just need extra time in their tests, something like that. Um, an IEP or an individual education plan provides a program of specialized instruction and supports to access and progress in the curriculum. So the IEP might involve being removed from the classroom to work with a special ed teacher. It's going to be a little more intensive. Uh, if you're in a private school, IEPs and 504s do not apply. You're probably going to get something called an official accommodation plan from your school. But regardless of which plan you end up with, the evidence that you receive school-based accommodations 
is so important if you are trying to get accommodations on AP tests, on the SAT, on the ACT, anything like that. The first thing that they're going to ask you is, what kind of accommodations do you have in school? And I remember a student of mine, such a bright young woman, just a delight to work with, um, and she was really struggling with the timing on a test. And when I talked to the family about, hey, have you ever considered um, getting her tested, getting accommodations, it came out that she actually was getting accommodations at school. Teachers were just saying informally, oh, if you want to finish up the test, you can come back during lunch and finish it. Well, that is wonderful from a teaching perspective, but from an accommodations perspective, she had no proof that the reason why she was getting great grades was because teachers were recognizing that she was taking a really long time to process more than their other students, and they were giving her extended time. So unfortunately, she wasn't gonna qualify for an accommodation on the test because she didn't have any kind of formal or written plan showing that her teachers were giving her this accommodation and that it was helping to even the playing field. So as wonderful as it is when teachers say like, oh, sure, I'll give you some extra minutes to, to finish up this test. If you find that you need that with a lot of your different classes, it might be time to have a formal plan rather than something that's a little more casual. So let's talk about specific accommodations. So if you've got ADD or ADHD, you are probably gonna ask for extended time on tests, um, potentially instruction and assignments that are tailored to the student, um, positive reinforcement and feedback, which is really, really helpful, assistive technology, more on this later, I've got a couple slides on that, allowing extra breaks or time to move around, um, so if you've got all that energy in your body and sitting still, it feels like torture being allowed to like get up a little more often than your fellow students uh, An environment with limited distractions. So maybe seating up at the front of the classroom so that you're not looking at everyone fidgeting and getting distracted by it or extra assistance in staying organized. It's extended time is essentially a given for a student with a diagnosis of dyslexia. It is the umbrella accommodation. It is the accommodation that is going to help the most students. You may receive double or even triple time depending on the severity of dyslexia. Because um, a lot of times you just need extra time to decode and make sure that you're not assuming that a word is what you think it might be. You wanna give yourself time to make sure that that's what it is. And even if students don't always use a reader or text-to-speech technology, it would be really key to figure out what they need for timed testing. So you might not need a reader in regular class or when you're reading a book on your own, but if you've only got a certain amount of time to get through something, having a reader might be really, really helpful. Um, so there's, there's different kinds of accommodations for dyslexia, and I would divide them into sort of four pieces. So presentation which would be giving verbal instructions instead of written or repeating those instructions, larger print, visual prompts or cues, basically the way that information is presented. Um, the response part. So you could mark your answers in your test book instead of on a separate answer sheet. Um, a lot of my students would have that accommodation, even when they didn't have dyslexia, honestly, sometimes that happens for ADHD as well, or if you have some kind of uh, visual processing disability. Of course, now that the SAT is digital and there is no answer sheet for that, um, it's kind of nice that some accommodations have started to be built in to some of these tests. And of course, an assistive technology like an audio recorder um, can also be helpful in recording your response or the setting. If you're, if it's helpful to be one person in a room or just a small number of people in a room or an alternative furniture arrangement, so you're sitting up front with the teacher, no distractions. And lastly, timing or scheduling. So obviously extended time, that's a big one. Uh, more frequent breaks because it is exhausting to do that much reading or changing the order of your tasks or subtests. Um, if a particular test has just sort of front-loaded reading and writing for you and you need a little time in between, um, that's sometimes something that can be arranged. So now let's talk about helping out from home, um, where these two particular people are just very frustrated with each other. So, so let's talk about how 
we can reduce that stress when you're at home. So overall, students really need instruction to change the way they view mistakes. So you can purposefully make mistakes. You can just point out when you yourself make mistakes, not on purpose, but it's just, you know, life to show that you can recover from them. I think a lot of times students, especially um, students who are neurodiverse, sort of assume that nobody else makes mistakes. They're the screw up. They're the only one who is struggling with this. So it can be really helpful to show them, no, everyone makes mistakes and that's how you learn. Um, I went to a talk a couple of years ago that was so fantastic with this wonderful mathematics professor who talked about how he, one of his favorite classes was a class called basically the art of failure. And it was about learning how failing is going to help you learn so much faster than if you do everything perfectly. And I know that I have seen for myself that a lot of my students are really afraid of failing. They're afraid of making mistakes. If they get something wrong, they immediately apologize. And regardless of your neuro background, I would say mistakes are necessary. They are vital for learning. But also, if you're dealing with somebody who feels like all they do is make mistakes, you wanna point out their strengths. So is your student a better listener than a reader? Then listen to your books if you need some assistive technology. Get the tools that will help you be your best. It is not cheating. It is just figuring out where you, like what, what is going to help you get to where you need to go. If you need to play music to block out more distracting noise while you're doing your homework, honor that. Make space for that. It is okay. Personally, I really love using this website called Coffeetivity, where you can select different kinds of background sounds. Um, so I can kind of make my office sound like a busy coffee shop. And that works really well for me because then it feels like, oh, I'm surrounded by all these people who are also working really hard. I too should be working really hard. So, you know, you figure out what exactly it is that's going to work for you. If you need to throw a ball against the wall to help you study and focus because that kind of kinetic movement is going to help you, find a way to do that without driving your sibling crazy. Maybe don't throw a ball against their wall. Maybe throw it on the wall that faces the outside. Um, you don't want to fight yourself. You don't want to make it harder than it needs to be. Work with your innate design. This is a big one, um, partializing tasks. We also call them chunking, um, taking something and dividing it into discrete, small steps. So for instance, this would be, if you are teaching somebody how to tie their shoes, you don't wanna go, okay, so you take these two things and then ta-da, tied your shoes. You wanna give it one step by one step at a time, um, a la Ikea and make it something that's more accessible. So you wanna make sure that you're planning on breaking everything down into smaller steps and having the student review those steps to figure out how they're going to do that. Using dialogue and inquiry when a student gets stuck is so much better than just lecturing them about it. Um, sometimes I like to say that, uh, being an executive function coach is really the art to asking a very good question at the right time. So if your student is getting stuck, asking them things like, can you describe what that feels like? Have you ever felt the same feeling on other tests or in other situations? What has worked in the past to get you unstuck? What, uh, especially referring to the past, helping them to go, okay, the last time that I, had a paper like this, this is what I did to write it. And this is what worked and this is what didn't. So I'm going to work from that. So being able to look in the past to draw a lesson for the future is really, really helpful because it also helps build their confidence where they can remember, oh, right, I did, I did do that. And then it was okay. Um, what about this particular passage or question gave you trouble? Um, helping them to be more aware of what's going on in their brain. So it isn't just, I don't know, it seems really hard to, it was very long and I got intimidated because it was a very long question. 
okay, that's much more useful than this question is hard. And now we know, okay, what can we do to break down those longer questions so that they don't feel as intimidating? And how do you think you can move past this if and when it happens on test day? Because you could freeze, you could realize like, I'm looking at this problem and I don't know what to do. And you know, one of your plans could be, I will run to the bathroom and cry and then not come back and take the rest of the test. And that's a choice, but let's come up with some other things to do before that happens. So just coming up with a plan for, if I blank in a question, what am I gonna do? I'm going to write, rewrite the question in my own words, see if that jogs anything. I'm gonna try to write down an equation. Uh, if I can't come up with an equation, I'm going to star it and come back to it later. Once I've done some other problems, maybe something will have jogged my memory. If I still can't figure it out, I'm just going to guess a letter and move on. So coming up with that game plan can really forestall any panic. The whole idea is you want to prime your student to begin to approach problem solving strategically. Right, get that prefrontal cortex, that part that, that might have some deficits to, to really get them to start growing in that area. It's okay to be frustrated, but you wanna analyze what's happening and then figure out a plan of action. So assistive technologies um, can be so, so helpful. I think one of the you know very few positive things to come out of the pandemic was that we realized that there are a lot of ways that we can make things accessible to people without being in person. So whether that's printed notes or audio recordings, video recordings, e-readers, my favorite productivity apps, um, all of these can be really, really helpful for students and it's important for them to know that they're out there. So this is uh, an app wheel, courtesy of our friends at Curry College. Um, I've got a link right here if you're interested in this. So basically, they've broken down the four areas where students might need assistance into studying, writing, organization, and reading. And then from there, they break everything up into even smaller categories. So for studying, there's the gathering information part, there's the memory part, and the mind mapping. Uh, and there's also some self-regulation, so making sure that you're actually doing what you need to be doing. So if you're studying and gathering information, it would probably be very helpful to have your favorite web browser, perhaps with bookmarks of things that you're really, um, you know, you want to come back to because that was a really good website, so you don't have to worry about memorizing it. Um, for mind mapping, there are so many different tools out there that can help you sort of link together your thoughts and create a coherent whole. And then self-regulation, I love that they've included a yoga app in there because sometimes you've been studying for forever, you feel like you're about to explode, so it might be time for a yoga break. Um, for writing, they've got things on note taking, recording lectures, speech to text, word processing, so many different helpful apps there. Um, organization, you've got reminders and to-do lists and calendars and digital storage. Um, for reading, there's digital textbooks and PDF readers and scanners and um, all kinds of different things that are going to be really, really helpful. Text to speech pops up there as well. Um, so this is this is definitely a good start to sort of think like, what do I need? Where can I go? And this is uh, something else that I think we don't really talk about as much, um, but it's the social emotional challenges of having executive function dysfunction. So a lot of times um, you might feel like your your emotions are also getting the better of you while you're struggling to do well in school or do well at your job. Um, so I strongly recommend this book, Brain Hacks. Um, I love my copy. It's very dog-eared at this point. Um, and it, what I really like about what Dr. Lara Honest Webb did was she wrote the book without referring to any particular diagnosis. So this isn't like a book for people with ADHD. The idea behind this is it is a book for anyone who feels like they need help with the way they work, with staying focused, with achieving their goals. 
And she does talk about the part that emotional regulation plays when you are struggling with executive function. So the first thing to do is to identify your emotions, to get to know your feelings. Um, and then weirdly enough, using visualizations to gain distance from your thoughts. Um, I am personally a really big advocate for meditating. Uh, I practice what I preach. I meditate every single day. And part of that is being able to realize that your emotions are kind of like clouds in the sky. So you might have a really cloudy day one day. You might have a really sunny day the next. But the idea is that these feelings and thoughts pass through, but they don't stay forever. And so using that kind of visualization can help you to feel like you are more than your feeling of frustration or you are more than your feeling of loneliness. And that can be really helpful to identify your emotions, but not self-identify with your emotions. Another one is listening to your body, whether that's doing a body scan to sort of go like, where am I? Oh yeah, I do have a headache. Oh, interesting. Or doing a checklist. Usually if one of my students is losing it, um, if I ask them, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Have you been outside today? Usually the answer is something along the lines of yes, yes, no. So that's always a good checklist if you're feeling really emotionally dysregulated. Do I need to eat something? Do I need to drink something? Do I need to feel the sun on my face? Building emotional resilience is a really big one. I think that a lot of people are having a tough time with that these days. So the first step in there is recognizing that feeling, right? That's the first step in all of this is recognizing, oh, I feel really angry. And then identifying the positives, not to be confused with toxic positivity, and then creating an action plan. So for instance, let's say that you auditioned for the school play and you didn't get in. So you need to recognize the feeling of I'm feeling really upset because I was really looking forward to it and now I'm not in it. I feel embarrassed because I told my friends I was auditioning and now they know that I didn't get into the play. And I'm just really sad because my other friends are going to be in the play and I'm not. And now I feel like FOMO that they're going to be having such a great time and I'm not going to be there. And then identifying the positives. So I did audition. I was really scared, but I auditioned and I memorized like a whole speech to do. And I did my best and I got called back, which is pretty cool. Like then not everyone got to do that. So yes, it does stink that I didn't get in, but there are those positives. And then creating an action plan, whether that's I'm going to go to the teacher and ask for feedback. What could I have done to do a better job so that I could be in the play? Or maybe what I really want is the sense of community. It, it isn't that I really wanted to be the lead in the play so much as I wanted to be with my friends. And I'm really sad that my friends are doing the show and I'm not. So maybe that means I'm going to see if they need anyone for running crew so I can still be part of the show, just not in the way that I was expecting. So creating this action plan, whether it's next play, I'm going to do an even better audition, or I definitely still want to be involved, so I'm going to figure out how to do that. The action plan helps you to take those emotions and create something positive from them. And of course, managing those negative emotions, giving yourself permission to grieve. It is okay to cry because you didn't get in the play. It is disappointing. It stinks. Feel those emotions. It's important to feel them before you let them go. And building an uncertainty tolerance. So this kind of goes back to something I've observed with a lot of my students where it feels like they're not giving themselves permission to fail. So it is really, really important to build in our students the ability to do something where they're not sure what's going to happen and that they're okay with that. So that could be auditioning for the school play, trying out for the lacrosse team. Um, you know, they're gonna compete in a solar car competition, like something where they don't know what the outcome is gonna be and it could be negative and that's okay. You, They need to be able to see that they can try something and it might not work out and they're still going to be okay because that's how really great things have been accomplished by people who were willing to fail. 
So the more that you embrace negative emotions and say like, okay, this stinks, I'm really disappointed, but I'm glad I tried because I would have been even more disappointed if I hadn't even auditioned. So now I'm gonna sort of break it down into more specifically um, each of those learning differences I was mentioning, what are some specific strategies? So again, looking for the strength in the diagnosis. ADD and ADHD can be something that can have benefits, right? There's a reason why our, some of our brains evolved to be this way. So whether that's the ability to hyper-focus, which can be helpful when you really need to get work done. Like some of my students say, as soon as, if I know that the deadline is tomorrow, it is amazing how well my brain's like, all right, I'm doing it. Because part of that adrenaline of, oh my gosh, it's happening tomorrow, gives them that dopamine. So just sort of recognizing like, what it, what is it that my brain does? Everything in life has pluses and minuses. ADD does not mean that you are doomed. It's just meaning, it just, excuse me, means you're figuring out what your pluses and minuses are. It is okay to fidget. It is really, really okay. It doesn't mean a student isn't paying attention. It doesn't mean that they're fooling around. You want to be able to get up and move while answering questions. That's fine. If you need a stretch break while you're studying or you need to pace around the room while you're reciting history dates, that's fine. Um, I we'll talk about this a little bit more, but annotating or active reading can be really helpful when you are sitting and reading a textbook. That can sometimes create enough movement that you don't feel like you're trapped in your own body. Attempting to inhibit the impulse to move takes up way too much cognitive capacity. If you need to move, move. Um, one of my students, his mom sort of warned me ahead of time that he um, it's really helpful for him if he draws orbits while he's working. And I said, that was fine. And she like was brought to tears because she'd had other teachers, other tutors say, you know, he needs to stop doing that. He's obviously not paying attention if he's drawing little orbits all over his paper, which is just not true. He was paying attention. He just needed some, he needed his body to be in motion. So don't fight it. It's taken up way too much of your time and energy. And shake it up as well. There is nothing that says I have to study for exactly an hour or exactly two hours, and then I'll know I'm good at studying. Uh, moving from topic to topic is like you're rebooting your brain. So it's really helpful in maintaining focus. So if you're getting bored with grammar, switch over to math, switch over to science. I personally really love the Pomodoro technique. Um, the idea is that you work for 25 minutes and then you take a five minute break, 25 minutes and a five minute break. It's called that because the person who invented it used their kitchen timer, which was in the shape of a tomato. Um, if you are a student with ADHD, I'd recommend something even like 15 minutes of work, 15 minutes of break time, or 15 minutes of work, 20 minutes of break time, whatever it is that's gonna work for you so that you come back. Um, I personally have an app on my phone called Focus Keeper, where I can set the intervals that I want and press go, and it will do all of that for me. It will tell me, okay, break time, and then it'll say, all right, back you go, and I can even count to see how many of these 25-minute chunks I've been working through, which really gives me a sense of accomplishment, which is wonderful. Bite-sized learning so important. I talked about this already with the, the chunking of the shoelace task, but if you can help your student view full sections of an assignment in smaller chunks, it makes it less overwhelming. So one passage at a time or one page of math, and you can pick your order that you want to do it in. Breaking large projects up into manageable chunks. I think the what can get really challenging about initiation, about starting something that feels really huge, is that it feels so intimidating that it's like you'll do anything other than doing that huge project. So if you can break it up into manageable chunks, then it doesn't feel as painful or as scary. And you also want to set short time limits, small goals. Two minutes better than no minutes. So even if it's, I'm going to study my times tables for two minutes and then I get a break and then I get to come back, that's great. 
And honestly, I would say that that is a better way of learning and memorizing than sitting and staring at something for an hour. Much better to learn for a little bit, take a break, and then see what your brain is still holding. Uh, even when in study sessions, you really want to take short breaks. Active breaks are the best. Taking a break from studying to look at your phone, eh, not as helpful as moving, walking around, stretching, go outside to change scenery, take your dog for a walk. Um, even if it's just a little quick chat about hobbies or their life or something less demanding, like just really giving them a brain break so that they can come back refreshed and ready to go. Distractions are going to happen and it's going to be okay. Um, I had a student who would get into sort of arguments with his parents because they would come in while he was in the middle of studying and they would ask him something and he'd be like, you can't, you're, you're interrupting my flow and now I'm going to get distracted. And I, uh, so what he ended up doing, and I thought it was a great idea was putting a whiteboard nearby. So you know, he can, his parents could write down something they wanted to discuss with him, or if he realized in the middle of studying, oh, right, my mom asked me to do that. I can't forget to do it. He could write it on the whiteboard so it's not going to disappear anywhere. And then he could come back to it later. A lot of times when students with ADHD interrupt you, it's because they're afraid they're going to forget the thing and they want to contribute to the conversation. So if you can get that thought out in the open, it's no longer taking up the primary focus in their head. They can listen to you. They can do writing. They can do whatever they need to do. And they know that that idea is there for later. So specifically students with EF deficits. This is, you know, you may not have ADHD, but you may still struggle with organization. Um, this, this picture may look exactly like your desk. So if that's you, Remember these executive function skills that I talked about low these many hours ago? Um, so if you know that you struggle with those, try not to give yourself more than three things to do, point by point, and then set goals, build a to-do list facilitated by technology for each of those three things. I know three things seems really small, but you know, you can always add something else to the list, but I would say start out with three things and then see how that goes. And again, you're working in 20 minute increments, you're taking mental breaks to get up and move around. Um, I would recommend having a homework book, whether that's analog or digital, where all the information is recorded in one place. I know that a lot of schools have like a centralized website where you go on and look to see what your homework is and when it is. But sometimes teachers aren't so great about filling that out. So it can be really helpful to have some kind of place where you're tracking that information as well. So if a teacher gives you a due date in class, but it's not on the website, you're still able to track that. An attitude is so, so important. Remember, it's so tempting every time you fail to think that this is it, this is the end. So anytime student makes progress, it is crucial to highlight it, to show them that they can do this. Students with EF issues are often harder on themselves to begin with, so you want to help them see success so that then they are confident to try something new or attempt something more challenging. The goal is self-efficacy. The goal is that they can do it without us. Um, Google Calendar is a lifesaver if you've got long-term assignments and you want to break them into manageable pieces. You can track your short and long-term projects and assignments and schedule in time to go, you know, take the dog for a walk, take a break, play with your little sibling. Um, it's a really great way to plan into the future. And if that seems like it's impossible, like I don't even know how to break down my long-term project, uh, AI will do it for you. If you can't break down your own tasks, Ina Garten says, AI is fine. So for, for example, um, this is a tool that I was just made aware of. I am a big fan. It's You can find it at goblin.tools. And basically you can put in any task that you have. And if you want, you press that little magic wand emoji and it will populate a suggested list of, okay, well, this is how I can break it down. So this is AI's version. I could have created my own version of steps that I wanted to take to write a research paper. But according to Goblin, um, if I want to write my research paper, I need to choose my topic, conduct research, gather sources, create an outline, write my introduction, write my body paragraphs, write my conclusion, edit and revise, and then make sure the paper is formatted according to guidelines. 
So if this paper is due in two weeks, I could try checking one of these off every other day. And suddenly something that seems really scary, really terrifying is no longer as scary. So it's great to have students see if they can chunk down um, their own responsibilities into smaller pieces. But if they're feeling stuck, if even that feels really overwhelming, something like Goblin, or I know there's a million other AI tools out there can kind of help them sort of break through that first wall of resistance. For dyslexia, technology is your friend, right? So digital books, text-to-speech assistive tech, um, all of that can really help students get through faster. Um, the If your student does have a neuropsychological report, I would recommend taking a look at the recommendations section. It is always worth a refresher to see what that uh, specialist recommended your student do. And dyslexia can also impact math, especially on those word problems. So don't forget that your student might need support here as well. If you've got that reading tutor, you might need a math tutor as well. And some students might slow down, carefully read every single thing. Other students might prefer using mnemonics or little songs and rhymes to encode information or doing active, active reading and really interacting with the text, which looks kind of like this. So you're underlining important information and circling transition words and names, and it can help the brain to sort of create a map of where information is located in the passage, particularly for passages that are formatted with less white space, which then makes them more difficult to read. So this kind of active written engagement can be really helpful. Reading cannot be passive. You need to deeply engage with the text, even if it's a long text and it feels really intimidating. So you might need to cover up paragraphs or diagrams and just sort of read word by line by line so you don't get too intimidating. So the more that you physically engage with the text, the better. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the strengths that come along with a dyslexic diagnosis, I strongly recommend The Dyslexic Advantage. It's a fantastic book. It talks about the hidden benefits of having dyslexia and includes examples of people with dyslexia making a difference in their fields by using their gifts. I love it. So if you've got, say, memory or retrieval issues, limit the amount of information that you're learning during any one study session. You may see this is a trend, right? Shorter sessions are better. You want to review prior knowledge so that you've got something to attach the newer knowledge to. And you want to space out those study sessions so the student can rehearse, reinforce that material, let it sort of percolate before trying to recall it. Forced recall is one of the best ways to remember anything. So the more that you can learn the information, go away and then force yourself to remember it, the better. And of course, if you can encode something using visual and auditory pathways, that's also gonna be helpful. So then you've got different kinds of memories reinforcing. Um, so like I said, that forced recall, especially within 24 hours. So I studied my list of French vocabulary words. I'm going to go away. And in 24 hours, I need you to test me. Uh, immediately writing key concepts down in a meaningful and structured way. S rounds of forced retrieval in different environments. If you're studying in your room, the next time that you recall those words, you should be in the kitchen. You want to make sure that the only place that it's not like a, I can remember it when I'm in my room, but nowhere else. If you're working with a student with auditory processing issues, you want to face that student when speaking so that they can see what you're saying. You want to minimize any distracting sounds. You want to articulate clearly at a good pace, clear, succinct directions. So if that means you need to write out what you're going to say to them, go for it. And of course, saying that they can always ask clarifying questions. They don't need to get it the first time around. If you've got a student with math challenges, whether that's dyscalculia or something else, you wanna help them to slow that problem solving process down and discriminate between this is relevant information and ah, I actually don't really need that. Again, looking at the steps involved in solving a given problem and reviewing those previously taught concepts, going back into the past, how did this help? How can I use that for the future? So in summary, every brain is different. There is no cookie cutter approach. The more positive and reinforcing and affirming you are, the better. We want to build self-efficacy. An individual grade is not as important as that student being able to 
re-evaluate their self-concept and their belief in themselves. You need to be flexible and responsive and creative when working with students with LDs. Um, I find that I'm a more interesting tutor when I work with students who force me to think what's a different way of expressing this. Um, you also want to emphasize strategy and strategic problem solving, put the student at the center so they can gain their sense of agency and make sure that they can skillfully advocate for themselves, which is a great tool for adulthood and beyond. So as a reminder, every student is different. So we're happy to make a custom recommendation for your student. Uh, here's the phone number you can call to talk about academic tutoring, test prep, or executive function coaching. Uh, if you're interested, you can give coaching a try and uncover your strengths and weaknesses um, with a mind print assessment, a custom coach match, or a custom coaching plan. And a writing workshop. So this is something brand new that we've been working on for the past year or so. And your student and a hand-selected tutor can work one-on-one -on -one to um, work through our five-part curriculum to become a more effective writer. And now, in the minutes that we have remaining is the Q&A. All right, so uh, Stuart wanted to know, is that app Focus Keeper? It sure is, Stuart. Um, I have it on my phone right now. It sent me a little reminder earlier today. Um, let me check all of my little productivity apps. Focus Keeper, yes, it looks like a it's got, it looks like a, a tomato that's been sliced down the middle. So that's the one that, that I really enjoy. Um, but there's, there are so many of them. They're all out there. Um, any suggestions for online task management, not just the school online homework tracker? Agreed. Um, I, I think the school online homework tracker is only as effective as the teachers and the teachers have a lot going on. Um, so as far as online task management goes, um, I actually, I'm old school. I really like uh, analog personally, um, and not just because studies have shown that if you write something down by hand, you're much more likely to, mem to remember it than you are if you type it. So I love my bullet journal. Um, what's great about it is that it can be as flexible as you want it to be. You can create lists. You can write down like, this is what I'm doing day by day. Um, it's It can be as flexible as you want. With some of my students, we realized that they really liked writing things down and having a to-do list. Um, but if it had a cover on it, they were never going to see it. So we ended up actually using an old school like legal pad because there was nothing covering it up. So every day he could look at it and go, oh, there's my to-do list. And it was right in front of him. Um, so that is a bullet journal, um, so named for the bullet points. And if you go on Pinterest, there are so many different examples of bullet journals. If you have an artsy kid who really loves drawing, there's a lot of people who do beautiful things with bullet journals. I am an art appreciator. I'm not really an art creator. So mine are a lot more straightforward, but I do like that it's as flexible as I want it to be. Um, can you help college students also? Absolutely. Um, I have worked with a whole bunch of college students, usually students who get to college and then realize, oh, mom and dad aren't here to be my executive function for me. This is really tough. Um, what's great about college students is that they've gotten far enough that they realize this is what I do well and this is what I do not do well. So I think college students can find executive function coaching really rewarding, um, especially if they're doing it because they're the ones excited about it, as opposed to, um, you know, a parent saying like, you're about to flunk out of school and this is it. Um, but as long as the student is engaged and ready to go, I think that that would be um, a really, really great thing for them to do. All right, and I think I've got time for maybe one or two more questions. So Lisa wants to know what suggestions do you have to get a psychoeducational assessment? What resources available and what is the cost? Absolutely. So cost is unfortunately um, sometimes can be a bit of a barrier for people. If that is the case, I would recommend checking in with a university in the area that has 
a psychology program, especially a doctorate, something like that, because oftentimes they will have um, reduced cost options because they are a teaching university. So that can be something if you're um, if you're worried about that cost, that can be something that's really helpful. Um, I'd also check in with your um, with your school district to see if there are any providers that work with the school. Um, there are definitely private psychoeducational assessment givers out there. And Lisa, if you want to send me an email through info at appleruth.com and let me know where you are geographically, I would be happy to make some suggestions for you about people in your area who might be able to help you out. All right. Well, it is exactly nine o'clock. Thank you all so much for your wonderful questions. Again, if there's anything that I didn't talk about tonight that you were hoping I would or something that pops up later, please feel free to email info at appleruth.com and I'll be delighted to answer any and all of your questions. Thank you so much and have a great evening.